to the Gospel according to Luke, uh, the very first chapter. We're in a series this Advent or Christmas season, looking at some of the different songs of, of Christmas. Uh, we just finished not too long ago singing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. That was written actually by Charles Wesley in 1739 and delivered on a particular Sunday uh, morning. Only in one place in the Gospel of Luke does the author speak in the first person, referring to himself, and he does it three times in the first four verses. Uh, Would you follow along with me as I read? Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Now here's the purpose clause. So that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. If you have the NIV Bible, it will say that you may know for certain, or certainty, I think is the word that is used. So never again in this gospel does Luke, who is a doctor, a physician, refer to himself as us or me. And the reason is very plain and simple. Luke wants to come right out and be crystal clear about the reason that he's writing. I'm writing this account, Theophilus, whose name, by the way, means uh, friend of God, or beloved, it was an honorary title. It may refer to a specific individual named Theophilus, or it may not. But he's coming out and he says, I want you to know for certain the things that you have been taught. He doesn't want Theophilus to know in a general sense, but to know the exact truth, which is in short supply these days in this relativistic world In which we live in. He says, I'm writing my good news so that you may know the rock solid, unchangeable, undeniable facts about what you have been taught. And he's literally saying, hey, these things, they are safe. They are safe from change. They are safe from ceasing to be what they are. They're safe from becoming unimportant or irrelevant. These things, Theophilus, will always be. And it was this kind of knowing that caused the early church to survive through the first three centuries of disillusionment, grief, appalling persecution, and martyrdom. You see, it was the certainty of God, the certainty of Jesus, the certainty of salvation, the certainty of faith, the certainty of the supernatural. So if you would turn to Luke chapter 2, Remember, he's writing this out in consecutive order. Teddy read for you earlier these verses 8 through 14. I want you to look, if you would, beginning in verse 10. An angel said to them, these are the shepherds. It was not just another night. It was a night of all nights. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people for today, or really tonight. In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior. He has a name, Christ the Lord. Notice this, good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. 
I want you to think with me for just a moment. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what kind of good news could affect all people equally? Anything come to your mind? Maybe you say, well, a, a cure for cancer would, would be good. But all of us don't have cancer. How about Alzheimer's or uh, AIDS or diabetes or heart disease? But that's not true for all of us across the board. How about the elimination of poverty? That affect us all? You're not looking all too hungry today. How about the end of war? That would certainly, well, not all countries are at war. For there to be good news of great joy for all the people, there could be no situation, no place, no people, no time, no culture where there is not good news. So what is it? Well, everyone who's ever lived on planet Earth who breathes in oxygen and exhales carbon dioxide, they need a savior. That's what it says. A savior for you, for me. Christ the Lord. A savior from sin, a savior from death, a savior from God's judgment, a savior from Satan and his demons, a savior from this evil world, and a savior from ourselves. This offers for you, it's for me, it's for your friends, it's for your neighbor. It's an offer that's open to anyone, for all people. Think about all the offers that have ever been offered you. How many of them affect all of us? No. They have built-in restrictions offers. You offer, you put down something on a house. They have limitations. They have expiration dates. A lot of them sound really good until you read the fine print. <laughs> then you read the fine print, you can often be very disappointed. This offer is for... Life eternal, for forgiveness of sins, for freedom from guilt and fear and shame. It transcends political boundaries, languages, customs, geography, status, income, religion, gender, every barrier. That's what makes it good news. It's for all people, for Americans, for Africans, for South Americans, for Europeans. It is good news. That's what Luke is trying to establish. And so he says, today, it was a real day in history. It was in a real city, Bethlehem. A savior to take away our guilt. The Christ to fulfill all of our hopes. The Lord to defeat all of our enemies. Make us safe. So Luke, who is a physician, who you'd think would be, well, he's very cerebral. He doesn't probably believe in the supernatural too much. The word angel is mentioned 283 times in the Bible. Angels are mentioned 89 times. Luke uses the word angel 24 times, angels nine times. 24 times he refers to a demon and 16 times to demons and five times to Satan. This very cerebral physician believes in the supernatural. You cannot read the gospel according to Luke and not believe in it. The Holy Spirit, oh, he's mentioned over and over again. Holy Spirit comes to Zacharias. The Holy Spirit comes to Mary. She's impregnated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon Simeon, as Daniel shared just a couple of weeks ago. And so these angels deliver a message to the lowliest of the low, these despicable shepherds. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. 700 years prior to this, in Isaiah chapter 61, there's a prophetic passage about the coming of this one, this Messiah, this Christ the Lord. And it says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. And he goes on and on and on. 
And Jesus, when he stands up in his hometown in Nazareth in chapter 4, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to captives, recover your sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. He comes for all people. That's why he came for you and for me. What kind of people are we? Well, the same kind of people who lived during Jesus' day. I want you to turn your Bible to John chapter 5. Craig and, and Shannon Stevens, our youth pastor, along with Kurt Geiger, just got back from the Holy Land not, not too long ago. You can, you can go to a lot of these places in the Holy Land today. This particular one here is the, is the pool of Bethsaida. Chapter 5, follow along with me as I read in John. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is, in Jerusalem, not some fabricated place, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticles. And in these lay a multitude of those who were, notice, sick, blind, lame, withered. They had all of this in common. They were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? Seems like a rather odd question, eh? But there are some people who don't want to get well. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool where the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps in before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. 38 years. That's a long time. Today was his day. Today, Jesus passed by that way. This guy lay there for 38 years, had hundreds of thousands of people that walked by this pool of Bethsaida who didn't pay attention to him, period. Or if they did, they had a little compassion. They couldn't do anything about it. But Jesus did not pass him up. The word afflicted has to do with being stricken. It has to do with suffering. It has to do with the feeling inside of you of helplessness. You ever felt that way? Suffering from anything? Guilt over your past? Regret over the past? Maybe presently some insecurities that you feel, some insignificance in your life, or maybe you're lonely. Or maybe you feel worthless and you wonder, what in the world is my life all about anyway? How long have you been in that condition? A year, six months, two years, five years? Got any habits that you struggle with that are afflicting you? Causing you anguish inside? But you see, today was his day. The timing of God is absolutely perfect. Sometimes some of us have regrets. You know, Christ saved me when I was 30. Why didn't I come to Christ later? Well, I didn't come to him. He came to me. <laughs> Today has been born for you a savior. He comes to us in our afflictions. You don't have to feel regret about, the oh, I should have done this. Forget about it. It's over. It's history. It's in the rearview mirror. But if you're suffering from some kind of affliction, don't wait 38 years. Just come. I want you to turn to your, your Bible to Mark chapter 5. Because Jesus came to bring good news, not only to the afflicted. The afflicted can be desperate, but we're going to look at a desperate woman. This is recorded in Luke's gospel as well. But in Mark chapter 5, 
If you look at verse 25, the word desperate means despairing, brokenhearted. It's a feeling of absolute hopelessness. No reason to live. I saw a picture of a woman. I think she was a fox anchor woman for news, 35 years old, two children, just committed suicide this last week. Shocked everyone. Suicide rates go super high. If you read my weekly email, you need to be by a hospital Christmas Eve because that's, that's where most people have heart attacks on Christmas Eve. You just, just, you know. In an 18-year 18 18 study in Sweden, they found that that's when most heart attacks. There's too much stress about Christmas and all the things that go along and so forth with it. This woman here was, was, was desperate. Look, she had a hemorrhage for 12 years, a slow bleeding, some issue for a woman, some female issue, not enough to kill her, just enough to make her miserable. Remember, if you had any issue or flow of blood, you were cut off from everything. You could not go into the synagogue. Your husband could not touch you. It doesn't tell us if she's married or not married. No one else could touch her because she's unclean. She's got an issue of blood. She had endured much at the hands of many physicians, not just one or two. She had gone to every doctor she could find. She had spent all she had and was not helped at all, not a little bit even. Rather had grown worse. She's out of money. She's out of doctors. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and she touched his cloak. Or as some say in other, it's in other uh, gospels, she touched the hem of his garment. And she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And immediately, not five seconds later, not ten seconds later, the flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that power proceeding from him had gone forth, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing them, and you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed your affliction. In the Old Testament, they said when the Messiah comes, when the anointed one comes, he's going to have healing in his wings. And the same word that you have for wings is the same word that you find touching the hem of the garment. She reached out and she touched that tassel. See, when the Messiah comes, he's going to come with signs. He's got healing in his wings. And she was healed. I received an email from John and Angela Condi on Friday. Uh, this, this was part of their email. A local divorcee with three children, call her Mrs. S, just identified herself as a follower of Jesus. This is in Pakistan. Her story began eight months ago when she was very depressed and suicidal. As she was planning how she might kill herself, she's got three kids. She heard a voice say, don't do this. You're my daughter. I'm your father, return home. She obeyed the voice, and that night she had a dream. Jesus took her by the hand, showed her a chapel at Bach Christian Hospital, and said, you can get peace here. This dream occurred several times, and later she had another dream of a pretty box in her hand. Opening it, she found a gold cross. That day, in the bazaar, she saw that exact box and a cross. All this prompted her to visit Bach Christian Hospital where John and Angela been ministering for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years when Musaret on our outreach staff led her to a fuller knowledge of Jesus. Pray for her. John and Angela say as she continues to know and love her Savior. Joseph had a dream. Don't be afraid to take Mary. Joseph had a dream. Take your son to Egypt. Joseph had a dream. Return to Nazareth. Luke records all these supernatural things that, that happen. 
But this was something that was supernatural. This issue of blood. You see, you have your issues. Now you all look nice and so forth. Got any issues with anger? That's just a symptom. There's something causing the anger. There's a root cause of that. How about bitterness? Unforgiveness? Are you desperate? Had some dreams shattered? Somebody shattered your dreams? Someone? Something? Brokenhearted? Jesus comes for brokenhearted people. Do you know anyone that's desperate? Some of your classmates. Parents going through a divorce. They're dealing with all kinds of issues in their lives. If we would just stop and look and not pass by them. Turn your Bible to John chapter 8. Jesus came for people like you and me who have a checkered past. All of us here today have a checkered past. There's no water walkers among us. Certainly not this man. Chapter 8, verse 1. Because Jesus comes and he came, a Savior to be born for us who are shameful. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came down, probably been praying, into the temple and all the people were coming to him and sat down and began to teach him. He began to teach them. There's an outer court, there's an inner court. Jesus is teaching. The scribes and the Pharisees are there, and they brought a woman caught in adultery in the very act. And having set her in the center of the court, you could get the picture. There's this big court. Jesus is there in the center, and he's teaching, and they bring this woman and throw her down right in front of him. Teacher, this woman caught in the very act. Hey, law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. They were, they were all pointing their finger at him, but Jesus took his finger, and he stooped down, and with his finger, he wrote on the ground. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to him, he was without sin among you. Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And he stooped down with his finger again and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they all began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. Why the older ones? I don't know. I guess they have more guilt and more sins and so forth. He was left alone. And the woman, where she was in the center of the court. If you get a picture of something like this, I don't know exactly what it looked like. But she's disgraced and she's doomed and she's useless. But what today, if I had you come on down and you were laying right here in front of me and all of your sins were flashed up there on the screen, no matter how old you are, whatever length of time and you've lived, they're, they're all there. How proud would you be? No, we'd all be shameful. We'd all be disgraced. We'd all be dishonored. And under the law, we'd all be condemned no hope whatsoever. You see, the gospel brings good news because God has a different grading system than we do. We grade people, we judge people, and so forth. So this woman's right down in front, and Jesus sent them all away. His eyes must have pierced through all of those Pharisees and scribes and sinners because, you see, every single one of us here has committed adultery in our hearts. You've all had lustful thoughts towards those of the opposite sex. You've think, thought things in your mind. There's none here that are not guilty. And Jesus is your only hope. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She found grace. She found mercy at the feet of Jesus. 
for all of your issues, for all of your sins, for all of your disgrace, for all of your shame, if you come to him, he'll have his arms open wide for you. If you're proud, you'll never come. But if you humble yourself, he'll pick you up. I I put this word useless here. Because there are some people, they think they've done so many bad things. Yeah, Christ can forgive me or God can forgive me for this or that or whatever. He could never use me again. (laughs) I'm here to tell you, God can still use you. Paul was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the church. He used to haul Christians off and have them beaten and killed. And so he says, me, the chief of all sinners, in in me, God has shown special grace. I'm the chief, public sinner number one, me, Paul. Don't ever think of yourself as being better than someone else when it comes to these issues of sin and iniquity and transgression. We should all be public sinners number one in our own eyes, and we cry out for mercy because we're doomed and disgraced and we're shameful, and he's the forgiver. Glory, hallelujah. (laughs) In excelsis Deo. (laughs) He's a good God. Mark chapter 5. Got your Bible there again? There's good news for the tormented. Look at it. Verse 5, chapter 1 came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. Got out of the boat immediately. A man with the, from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He had his dwelling among the tombs. That's a great place to live in a cemetery. People are dying to get in there, but he was dying to get out. No one was able to bind him anymore. They couldn't bind him with a chain because they often bound him with chains and shackles and chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue that guy. Now look at this verse five. Constantly, not once in a while, day and night, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains, gashing himself with stones. He was probably naked. A lot of the time, he must have had scars all over his body. Jesus, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him, shouting with a loud voice, what business do we have? There's more than one demon in him with each other. Jesus, son of the most high God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. You see, to torment means to be anguished. It means to be haunted. It means to be in a wretched, miserable condition. For Jesus had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what's your name? My name is Legion, we're many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send him out of the country. A large herd of swine, you know what happens? They all dash over the edge. Then they want to throw Jesus away because all the pigs were gone. The tormented. Anything tormenting you? Or is, are you all clean with him? Everything is open and laid bare, so don't, don't try to hide. This guy was screaming, not only on the outside, but our world, people are screaming on the inside. Some of you wonder, does, does God really care for me, little old me? Does he really love me? Well, I'm not too lovable. None of us are, are in that category. He reaches out to the unlovable, to lost people, to you, to me. You know any friends that are tormented? Any classmates that are tormented? Any neighbors that are tormented? Any relatives that are tormented? I spoke to Valley Golden Angels on Friday, and <clears throat> one of our couples there, if I were to mention them, her brother has one month to live. That was Friday. Today I spoke to the person. I said, 
He only has today left. And he's not a follower of Jesus. You know what it's like to be tormented forever? The rich man was tormented. Lazarus, who had suffered here on earth, was whole. And the rich man was in torment. Have you come to torment us before our time? You see, hell knows that their time is limited. Uh, Craig uh, showed me, a, uh, sent me this picture. He was just there as I sped with Kurt and his wife Shannon. The Sea of Galilee. This is Sea of Galilee 2018. Now, flip in your Bible to Mark chapter 6. Just have to turn it over a page for me. Now, this sea looks pretty calm. But uh, Craig said, you know, the, the, the winds come down over there, and those, the waves on the Sea of Galilee can be 15 feet high. You, 15 feet, I'm about almost six. Double me and a, another half. <laughs> you got 15 foot waves. Look at verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. This was not like, okay, here's a ticket. If you want to come on board, get on board. No, he, he made them get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he says, hey, goodbye, guys. He left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea. Craig told me, I don't know how long this thing is, 20-some miles or something like that. I don't know exactly. He was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night. That's, that's 3 o'clock in the morning. They've been rowing and rowing and rowing and straining. Came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass them by. They saw him walking on the sea. They supposed it was a ghost. I haven't seen any ghosts recently. Someone asked me after the first service, says, have you ever seen a ghost, Glenn? I said, "Not, no, no. They all saw him and they were terrified. They were not just a little anxious, a little concerned, a little worried. They were terrified. They were fearful. They were panicking. Immediately he spoke with them and said, hey, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. They had not gained any insight from the incidents of the loaves when he fed the 5,000. Their hearts were hardened. Got any fears? Fear is the, uh, the root of all indecision. The reason we don't step out of the boat in our lives and do things and so forth is because uh, so much is fear. If you wait for perfect conditions, you know you'll never get anything done Ecclesiastes 11.4 says. Our only one that we should fear is to fear God with a healthy respect for who he is. That's the beginning of wisdom and the f that's the fear of the Lord. That's understanding. You take your fears and you come to Christ in, in, in faith. You go to Bethlehem and see this one who was born for you that day in the city of David. He had tiny little hands and tiny little feet. And those tiny little hands and those tiny little feet were one day going to be pierced with nails for you and me. He hadn't done in Bethlehem one miracle. He was just a baby. But he was going to grow up. But he was in that little manger, the Savior of the world, your Savior, my Savior, your deliverer, my liberator from all of my past, from all of our transgressions and sins. He had to come. The cross was real. He stretched out there. Love is a contact sport. It's not American football. It's not the New England Patriots. It's a contact sport. 
And you'll, you can't love people from a distance. You got to get close. He came close. He came near. He became one of us. He took on human skin, moved into our neighborhood so we'd know what he's like. That's why you can behold him. He comes for the afflicted. He comes for the fearful. He comes for the desperate. He comes for the brokenhearted. That's what Christmas is all about. Just one more flip. Back to Luke chapter 2, where we started. And it tells us, after these shepherds came, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus were not out in the fields. These shepherds came and told them what had happened. And this is what Mary did. Look at verse 19. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. What do you cherish? Who do you cherish? What do you treasure? Who do you treasure? Treasure this Christmas season afresh. God's precious and magnificent promises. For today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior. He's alive today, and he's on the throne, and he's available like never before. He's not only available, he is willing, and he is able to handle all of your afflictions, all the things that torment you. It doesn't matter. Just come as you are. So, Father, you see every single one of us here today, just as we are. We're not accidents. We're, div we're divine uh, <laughs> births, all of ours. And you came to us, you came for us, so that you could be with us in our afflictions, in our situations, in our brokenness in the things that torment us so that you could heal us. So may your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, remind us afresh this Christmas season about the kind of Savior you are, a personal Savior, for unto you, unto Daniel, unto Tina, unto Glenn, unto Dave, unto Becky, unto Seth, a Savior, Christ the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You didn't love us just from a distance. No, you came to us. And you come to us uh, at deeper levels in all of our pain and all of our affliction and all of our trials. You'll be with us there when we're holding our loved one's hand when they take their last breath. You'll be with us at the, at the graveside when their bodies are laid there in the ground. And you're for us. And if you're for us, then no one can really be against us that matters. You came near to be a real, personal, powerful Savior. And we, we just say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How long is forevermore? You shall reign forevermore. Would you flip that slide up there? Ah, uh, the truth about Christmas. Luke wrote it out in consecutive order. And as we were departing today, I, I remembered this old song. I'd, I'd like us to say this together because it talks about his living, his dying, his burial, his resurrection. And forevermore, he's going to reign 
One day he's coming on glorious day. Let's, let's say this together. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. And he will reign forevermore. He's reigning right now. And this is my word for you as you go today. A personal word from Paul, who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 5, wrote these words. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He's reigning, and the only way you can reign is through him. But if you have him, you have all of him. You will reign in life in these 70 years, or if due to strength, 80, or for some a little bit longer, you can reign. You can trust him this week. Today, you can trust him. Tomorrow, you can trust him. For 2,000 years ago, these angel, this angel came for has been born for you today in the city of David, a real city, a real place for you, for me. Christ. The Lord. Yield to him this week, and you will reign. Take one of these cards. There's some in the back. You might be surprised if you invite someone. They just might come. Have a good week. We'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday, the 23rd, Christmas Sunday.